Well, uh, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is, <coughs> sorry, my name is Aidan Hetherington, and I'm the Corporate Engagement Manager for the Business School. Um, and I'd just like to extend a very warm welcome to you all tonight. And a particularly warm welcome, of course, to all members of the uh, um, Asia Scotland Institute, with whom we are partnering tonight. Um, I just want to give some very, very brief housekeeping points and then just say a little bit about uh, the school itself. First of all, if any of you got got one of these, please make sure it's either switched to silent or, or off. Um, we are not expecting um, a fire alarm tonight, so if the alarm does go, then the, uh, there's an exit right at the top and an exit just here, and members of staff will lead you out uh, from there if an alarm goes off. And of course, uh, Jonathan at the end, during the drink reception, will be uh, signing books. Um, so if any of you want that, then do avail yourself of that. Um, the theme of tonight is, is all about China, and I'm sure you'll not be surprised to hear that the business school um, has many connections uh, with, with the country, not just through the significant number of uh, students that we have studying here from China, but also in terms of agreements that have recently been signed with uh, Peking University School of Management and Shringha's Institute of Energy, Environment and Economy. Um, and the thematic thread that sort of connects both these links with, with, uh, with these uh, uh, prestigious Chinese partners um, is, uh, is low carbon and sustainable business, uh, driven forward by uh, key colleagues in our Center for Business and Climate Change, who run our MSc uh, in Carbon Finance and soon be running um, an MSc in energy finance. So we have lots of very deep links uh, with China. Um, and this particular event uh, is one of uh, a program of guest speaker events that we put on. And that in itself is just one of a range of activities that we carry out uh, to foster our links with the wider community. And other activities that we do to foster those links include things like student projects, internships, company treks, consultancy, collaborative research, um, master classes, tailored courses, and other executive education activities. And if any of you from organizations that would like to perhaps explore a little bit more about how you could work with the school, then do see me over the, uh, the usual customary glass of wine that we always have afterwards, uh, after this event. Uh, anyway, that's probably enough uh, from me in terms of my, uh, my elevator pitch about the school. What I'd like to do now is uh, hand over to Ronnie Gao uh, from the Asia Scotland Institute who will introduce tonight's speaker and the format of the event. Thank you very much, Robbie. Aidan, thanks very much indeed. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to begin by thanking the uh, Business School of the University of Edinburgh for, again, hosting us. Um, if our objective were to make sure the auditorium is always filled, we have exceeded it today. Because I see there are people with no seats. You can sit on stairs and um, maybe just, it's very nice to have you with us here it's probably the smallest member of the audience <laughs> anyway uh, first of all to explain the format this evening is that I'm going to introduce uh, Jonathan Fenby I will also introduce when we come to the Q&A uh, the panelist who's going to join us who is almost Matthias Zachman who heads the chairing Japanese Chinese relations and is head of Asian studies studies at the University of Edinburgh lovely to have you with us Matthias thank you uh, the other thing my technical friend says that if your telephones are on the silent mode, you can tweet us. And if you want to do that so that we can compile some uh, questions that we can add to the Q&A and the Q&A session, please feel free to do so. What do people have to tweet? It's on the last slide. It will come on the, It'll come on the last slide. Okay, so store your questions. You can put them on there. I'll put the last slide on so that people can do it. Thank you. So you tweet at Asia Scotland in INS. Uh, that's the one on there. Okay. Good. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Jonathan Fenby this evening as our guest speaker at this event, um, sponsored jointly with the Asia Scotland Institute, of which I'm the founder and chairman. And it's hard to imagine, actually. Um, anybody uh, more appropriate than Jonathan, given our mission, which is to promote understanding in Scotland of Asia, and perhaps more specifically, to equip tomorrow's leaders with the knowledge and skills to re-engage with Asia as their forebears did. I suppose, in summary, 
our objective is to be a wake-up call for young Scots men and women and all Scots people uh, about potential in Asia and to appreciate the need to understand that. Jonathan Fenby is extraordinarily well informed <coughs> on global and Chinese matters. Educated at King Edward VI School, Birmingham, and Westminster School in London, he later graduated from New College, Oxford. His career in journalism and writing is extremely impressive, as you will discover. On going down from Oxford, he was recruited by Reuters in 1963, remaining there for 13 years, latterly as Paris Bureau Chief. After being appointed Chief Correspondent for the Economist in Paris and Bonn, and writing three books during that period, Jonathan moved <coughs> on in 1986 to be the home editor of The Independent at its launch in that year. He was deputy editor of The Guardian from 1988 to 1993, editor of The Observer from 1993 to 1995, and then finally The South China Morning Post from 1995 to 2000, during the time of the return of Hong Kong to Chinese, so Chinese sovereignty. And that was the time when you may remember some of you that the Prince of Wales referred to this event as the Great Chinese Takeaway. Between 1998 and 2008, a 10-year period, Jonathan wrote and published 10 books, of which five are on China. And in 2000, he was appointed the commander of the British Empire, or CBE, for his services to journalism. A few quick quotes of people's reaction to the book, which is on sale outside afterwards. Leading China, com China commentator Jonathan Fenn's latest book on China's position in the world offers a nuanced picture of the country's strengths and weaknesses. That from the China Daily. Jonathan Fenn understands to its deepest roots the nature of the Chinese Communist Party rule and its effects throughout society. The, the party will therefore hate his eloquent and merciless dis dissection of its entire record and performance. But readers new to China should start right here. A smart, wise, well-written essay which answers with much common sense and learning one of the biggest questions of our time, Chris Patton. In this brief but thought-provoking book, acclaimed China specialist Jonathan Fenby challenges and punctures a number of myths about China's rise and offers valuable insights to its current dilemmas and unpredictable future, a stimulating must-read for all observers of the China Sea. I think that will give you a feel for this witty, wise, and informed man. A hugely observant follower of Chinese events, and we are all deeply grateful to him for travelling north to Scotland to share his thoughts with us. John. Well, uh, thank you much, Roddy. I don't know if I can live up to that uh, quite. Um, but uh, obviously, as you said, I went to Hong Kong in 95 to edit the South China Morning Post, which was at that time the most profitable newspaper in the world. Uh, not thanks to me, thanks to the advertising director, who was a wonderful woman, uh, Sally Chow, who always kept her head down, earned the money, and gave the editor the credit. And uh, such advertising directors should be encouraged. But that got me very interested uh, in China. It was the, I mean, both the story of the transition, of course, from British rule to Chinese rule. Um, but uh, while Hong Kong itself was extremely interesting, what was happening across uh, the border uh, in mainland China was that much more interesting and more important. It was a period of change and reform. Uh, Xu Rongji, the very forceful prime minister, was trying to shake up uh, the economy. Uh, China was uh, preparing to enter the World Trade Organization. Uh, and really, the fruits of the Deng Xiaoping uh, revolution uh, were taking shape and becoming evident. Um, we'll come back to Deng in a moment. But I would say, as a kind of author's uh, shorthand, Mao changed China by leaving the communists to power in 1949. Deng changed the world by opening up China uh, to the rest of the world from the end of the 1970s. And that is, I would say, the most, it has become the most important global event uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, so China obviously is up there centre stage, uh, or should be, uh, in all our preoccupations. Uh, and uh, sometimes one feels that uh, in, in, in Britain, that uh, the, I know that everybody says all the time, say in government and so on, how important China is, but actually it doesn't occupy that 
big and that central uh, a place uh, in a country which uh, is becoming perhaps more insular uh, than global, uh, but that's uh, another story. Uh, China, on the other hand, was to a large extent insular for, on a huge scale. Uh, for a lot uh, of its history, but has become very much more global, first of all economically, but now I would argue uh, politically uh, too. And Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader at the moment, who's been uh, in office as General Secretary of the Communist Party, the most important job in China uh, since the end of 2012, is I think reshaping uh, China's global policy, uh, which I will uh, come to and say a few words uh, about later on, and I'm sure we'll talk uh, about China and Japan, among other uh, subjects uh, then. So China is this, uh, whatever phrase we want to use, the elephant in the room, the big dragon, da -da -da, and, and so on and so on, uh, uh, for our age. But I think, uh, and I'd like to start with this, it is very important always to place what is happening in China uh, in 2015 uh, and what has happened in recent uh, decades in China in the broader historical framework. Um, I, I'm not one who believes uh, that the uh, length and strength of Chinese civilization, the Confucian state uh, as it's called, uh, ensures that China will dominate the world and will, ring, will uh, rule the world. First of all, because I don't think that's the way Confucianism points. And secondly, I'm not entirely sure that China is such a Confucian state uh, at the moment. Uh, materialism seems to be more important than Confucianism uh, for most Chinese, which is nothing wrong with it at all, but it's just the, the, the love affair with Confucianism can go, I think, uh, rather too far. So I don't believe, uh, to answer the question there, um, and you can all leave immediately because I've done it, the answer is two contiguous letters in the middle of the alphabet, N and O. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a school of thought that China is heading for an enormous crash, that uh, for various reasons, be it the banking system, be it the political system, be it the property, the, the market, uh, the dependence on fixed asset investment, uh, building more and more things, uh, that China is bound to collapse. The first uh, uh, book uh, written in this uh, direction appeared called uh, The Coming Collapse of China uh, appeared in 2001. And we're still asking the author, is it this year or next year? When is it going to come? Uh, it was going to be 2012, but it didn't happen then. Uh, so we have extremes of China. It's one of the difficulties of following China or writing about China that one is expected very often to take one view or the other. It's a Manichaean view. And if uh, I worked for The Economist uh, for a while, as Roddy said, and at The Economist, when people said, were we of the left or of the right, our reply, which was typical clever economist, because of course The Economist is not of the left usually, is we belong to the extreme centre. And I rather take that view uh, with China, because I think there are so many elements in China at the moment, which you have to try to bear in mind and you have to try to connect if one is going to start to arrive at any assessment of this extraordinary country and where it is going, um, that uh, it is very difficult to take a, a cut and dried view one way or the other. There was a, a fine uh, American uh, sinologue, unfortunately, uh, died a couple of years ago, Rick Baum. Uh, who said he was talking about modern Chinese history, but it could apply much more widely. The wonderful thing about China is you can take one point of view in the morning and marshal all the evidence you want for it, and in the afternoon you can take the opposite view and find just as much evidence. And that is so in lots of ways uh, uh, about China today. But I think, as I say, uh, it, it's always important to go back uh, in history. And I would start... Um, in the 1830s, uh, the uh, first opium war, uh, with many Scots, of course, playing a large part in the free trading uh, movement of the sale uh, of drugs to China, uh, which was pursued by the British in the name of free trade, but was all a complicated uh, matter of the, the, the British were drinking too much tea and buying too much Chinese porcelain, and there was a big trade deficit uh, at that point what's new, uh, and the British answer to that was to export opium from India uh, to China, to put that right, which of course uh, the emperor eventually didn't like, although opium was already used in China for medicinal purposes, and blockaded uh, the only port in China then opened to foreigners, Canton, uh, down on the, the Pearl River, and the British sent in uh, their heavy uh, ships, which 
routed the uh, imperial junk fleet, as you can see on this uh, uh, imagined uh, painting of the occasion. And that followed, that led to the Treaty of Nanjing, the first of the unequal treaties, uh, whereby the British took trading concessions in uh, Shanghai, Canton, Wuhan, uh, and other places, and their citizens in China were exempt from Chinese law. They were living, they were colonialists. I mean, there's no doubt this is an imperial uh, movement, uh, but it was relatively limited, it has to be said. It was limited really to the trading places where the Europeans, to begin with the British, then the French, the Germans, and others, uh, wanted to be. It was more economically driven, in a sense, than classic uh, imperialism uh, with its uh, occupation uh, of land. We had the, the, the British-French uh, expedition then against Beijing in 1860 with the destruction of the Summer Palace. Uh, we had, uh, at the same time, uh, the growth in Japanese power uh, and the Japanese-Chinese War of 1894-5, which the Japanese overwhelmingly won. The Chinese were routed uh, in that war, and the Russians always pushing down from Siberia uh, in the north. So undoubtedly, China was under foreign pressure and foreign threat at that time, and this continued, of course, in the 1930s with the Japanese occupation of Manchuria in 1931, and then full-scale war from 37 to 45. Uh, and that leading then to the communist victory in 49. That period goes down in uh, Chinese official history at the moment as the, China, as the uh, century of humiliation where the foreigners were responsible for the decline of a country, a vast country, which in around 1800 had accounted for one third uh, of global wealth. Uh, it is estimated. Now, I don't in any way want to be a revisionist imperialist uh, and defend what happened, uh, but I think the, the proximate, the main cause of China's decline during that period was actually internal rather than external. Indeed, the emperors didn't take the foreigners very seriously until the very end of this and the Boxer uh, rising. The, the, real, the main reasons for China, this strange uh, phenomenon of the decline of China, was internal. It was the huge revolts in the middle of the 19th century, which are hardly, I'm sure here they're studied uh, at Edinburgh University, but would be very little known uh, in the, the West as a whole. The Taiping Rebellion, which continued for 15 years and may have cost 20 million dead, nobody quite knows. Uh, the uh, Nian, a uh, huge rebellion by armed uh, horsemen in the east of China, the splitting off of Muslim kingdoms in the southwest uh, and the west, uh, and the imperial dynasty and really not knowing how to deal with any of this and having to delegate power, a kind of devolution of power, to the rural Confucian uh, gentry who were now allowed to raise armies, which was against the, the law in China, but they were called militia self-defense uh, units, and these beat the, the rebellions. But it made the emperor, the empire, dependent for its survival. And remember, the imperial uh, dynasty, the Qing, were foreigners. They came from outside China. They came from Manchuria. And Han Chinese increasingly uh, resented them and disliked them uh, as foreign rulers. Uh, then we go after the fall of the empire in 1912, period of 10 years of warlord anarchy, uh, then Chiang Kai-shek leading the northern expedition, establishing the nationalist government in Nanjing, but really only with ever control over Shanghai, Nanjing, uh, and a few of the, the central Yangtze uh, areas of China. Then the Japanese come on the scene. Um, then 49, after four years of resumed civil war, uh, Mao, uh, the communists, uh, take power. And at that point, uh, a new China is proclaimed. China can stand up. Uh, Mao didn't actually say it uh, in this proclamation on October the 1st, but he did say it on other occasions around there. Uh, but if you then take the Mao periods, uh, you have a series of enormous convulsions which did enormous harm uh, to China. While Mao had brought unity and some social advances, undoubtedly, uh, in literacy, uh, life expectancy, and other things, but the price paid uh, was enormous uh, over those uh, Mao years, uh, starting with the anti-rightist campaigns, the land uh, rectification campaigns, then 
uh, the Great Leap Forward. It's rather touching that the official Chinese target in the Great Leap Forward of industrialization was to overtake British steel production within 20 years. I mean, it shows how the world's changed. Then the, 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 the famine, 40, 45 million people killed around 1960, died from the famine, which was partly for natural causes, natural reasons, but was also undoubtedly uh, augmented by government policy and lack of government policy. And then now being pushed onto the back foot, coming back, springing back into power and launching the Cultural Revolution uh, in 1966, which lasted till his death in 1976, uh, with all the uh, familiar uh, images uh, of Red Guards. And Mao basically enlisting or trying to enlist the youth of China to overthrow the very political structure which he himself had brought in in 1949 endlessly adventurous uh, Mao, endlessly fidgeting, un un unhappy with the status quo. Whatever. And I would say that this history, which is why I've gone through it here, from the late 1830s through to Mao's death in 1976, represented a longer period of convulsions, violence, suffering, national disunity, invasions, etc., plus a lot of natural disasters, of course, along the way, that any country on earth has ever suffered. And that forms, it's not so much the century of humiliation, although as I say I, I would take uh, issue with that, but it's that background uh, of national weakening, national division, uh, suffering on a huge scale for people that I would argue serves almost like the popular psychological underpinning for what has happened to China since Deng Xiaoping uh, won out in the power struggle after the death of Mao uh, in 1978. Um, so when you talk, and you might have your views on this, when you talk about stability in China as a, a plus for the regime, a very important plus, the need to retain stability, uh, I, it, it perhaps doesn't mean that much to people in the West who take national stability uh, for granted. Having said that, of course, I know I'm in Scotland now, so perhaps uh, things will turn out rather differently. But uh, it, it's, that stability and national unity means something, I think, in China in general. I know this is a broad brush uh, popular psychology uh, conclusion, which it doesn't uh, in, in, many, in many other countries. Uh, and that has been a very important uh, sorry, a plus point for um, the regime, the communist regime. Deng Xiaoping, as I say, uh, changed China and changed the world. Uh, Deng, as you know, was a lifelong communist. He joined the party as a teenager in France in the 1920s. He was also a very patriotic Chinese. He was also a great survivor who'd come back from being purged uh, again and again. And he could see, I believe, in 1978 uh, that China was in a terrible state after all this history and the, the the, the Mao period and the Cultural Revolution. But that at the same time, the Communist Party was in a terrible state too, because Mao had practically destroyed his own child there. Uh, and Deng wanted to make China a great power and ensure that the Communist Party remained in charge of China. And he, I, there's no record of him waking up one morning and saying this eureka moment. But he realized uh, from being, he had written a bit about economics in the past, but probably from being uh, advised by his, his closest uh, assistants, that the way to achieve these two aims was through economic growth. That there was this huge untapped potential in China in cheap labor and in cheap capital, because there was nothing to spend your money on, your savings on. Uh, and at the same time, the world would welcome cheap Chinese goods as a way of uh, fighting inflation. Uh, and in the case of the United States, as a new customer for treasury bonds, of course, from recycled Chinese uh, trade surpluses. And he recognized, uh, Deng, that if this could be done through the Communist Party, even if it meant considerable ideological contradictions and problems, but these can be dealt with, of course, they always can be, um, the, the, this would give the Communist Party a legitimacy to rule as the party which had brought this new wealth and material uh, advancement uh, to the world's most populous nation, and which in due course pulled more people out of poverty in a shorter space of time than we've ever seen uh, before in human history. And that basic equation that the leadership will bring economic uh, material uh, advancement to Chinese as a whole, and we'll come to the problems of that in a moment, in return for being 
uh, uh, accepted as the monopoly uh, political power, not accepted by every, everyone, of course, but when uh, the crisis <coughs> came in 1989 and uh, the demonstrators, the protesters in Beijing were put down by force and killed, that in the end, the Chinese, that would be accepted uh, under a bargain in return uh, for uh, economic improvement. I think Deng, that, that was, if you like, the, the, the one uh, uh, insight that he had. Uh, whatever you think of the uh, results of that for politics and the political system and human rights. And of course, the effect was runaway growth in the 1980s, which culminated in uh, inflation, corruption, the protests uh, of the, uh, the spring uh, of 1989, the putting down of that, the relaunching of economic growth uh, with Deng's summer tour, southern tour uh, in 1992. Uh, and then under what I mentioned at the beginning, Zhu Rongji shaking up the system, bringing China into the WTO, even absolutely committing it to the world trading uh, system. And the result of that in this century, you can see in the quarterly growth figures there, uh, which generally remain above 7%, sometimes rising uh, in uh, 2007 as high as 13%, dropping off very sharply during the international uh, the global financial crisis, but then recovering all, just about as sharply there. I mean, that, that V line on the, on the end is what I think most chancellors of the, of the Exchequer and finance ministers would give their eye teeth for. You know, that it showed the potential for recovery in China, helped, it must be said, with, by a lot of government money, um, but then China had a lot of money uh, and still has. The Hu Jintao era, uh, of rule in China from 2002 to 2012 is now often dismissed as oh, 10 wasted years, a wasted decade, because very little was done. But with those kind of figures, you can see why. Everything seemed to be going pretty well. And when uh, the government the, and the Communist Party threw a huge amount of money uh, at the problem, after the global financial crisis, when Jabbar, the prime minister, uh, would say, well, we've, we've solved our problems. Uh, how are you going to do that in the West? We have, a, uh, we, we, we have, have uh, uh, followed policies which have enabled us to get out of the trouble while you're still floundering. But the recovery uh, then under the stimulus package uh, put forward in 2008, which consisted of uh, a, spending on infrastructure, particularly the railways, uh, the power grid, and so on, but also much more important, a huge opening of credit, for, uh, 4 trillion uh, RMB uh, in credit. Uh, you know, you, any, the banks would give you a loan for anything you wanted, roughly, and the, the country was awash in money, and a lot of that was very, very badly uh, used, misallocated, or put in people's pockets, uh, and you had what, when Jabal was describing, within a year or so of his triumphalism in 2009 was you had an economy that was unsustainable, uh, uh, unbalanced, and needed reform. Uh, when Jabba, when he made these uh, statements uh, in, in August, the summer of 2010, and he linked it to the need for legal and even political reform, he was squashed by the Politburo uh, of the Communist Party. Because, remember, China is the last major Leninist system on earth. And in that system, it's the Communist Party that is more powerful, more weighty, more important than the government. People often refer to Xi Jinping, the current leader, as President Xi, particularly when he's traveling, because that's, he's traveling as state president. But his important job is as general secretary of the Communist Party. And these seven men, and they are all men, uh, who were, choose your verb, selected, appointed, elected, chosen, who knows what, anointed, uh, to make up the standing committee of the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party in November 2012. These are the seven men, as you know, uh, who hold the, the, the power in China. And I spend quite a lot of my time at our research service, Trusted Sources, uh, which I helped to set up seven years ago, and I run the China team there, trying to think, how are these men going to move tomorrow? Um, and so you can make a few uh, informed guesses, but of course you can't know everything, it's all pretty opaque. You have Xi Jinping there, uh, third from the left, looking a bit, mm, what am I doing here? You know, he's slight thing that's funny. Standing behind him very much for attention, Li Keqiang, uh, the Prime Minister, number two in the Politburo, who was Hu Jintao's protege to take over from him as successor, but she played the politics brilliantly and came out ahead uh, of Li Keqiang, who remained 
loyal. And I think the, the idea of factions at the top in China, which was around in 2010, 2012, means much less now because everybody has to get into Xi Jinping's tent or else, for reasons I'll explain, uh, you're likely to be in trouble. Uh, in mo most, one of the most interesting men is the one on the right, uh, Wang Qishan, uh, who has two th unusual things going for him. First of all, he's the only one not wearing a red tie, as you'll see. On this. this is when they came out in the Great Hall of the People. You know, the new standing committee is unveiled. It's, it's a bit like a talent show because it's not, you know, they come out in the order of voting. Number one, Xi Jinping. Number two, Li Keqiang, and so on and so on. Um, uh, Wang Qishan, who came out number six, uh, he had been the economics uh, expert in the previous administration, but he was put in charge of the Dis Party Discipline Commission, which is a fearsome uh, entity which can pick anybody up, hold them uh, without charge in a secret location for recurrent six-month terms. Uh, this is outside the legal system completely. And these are the people to be afraid of uh, uh, in China. I know uh, a Shanghai businessman who was picked up by them and he was held in prison for about three months. His family weren't told where he was or anything. Uh, and he was finally, he was let go. And he never knew what he'd done, but he knew that he'd better be careful thereafter. And he can't leave China, for instance, uh, and so on. Uh, Wang Qishan's other uh, claim to individuality is if you look at his hair, uh, he has a rather awkward comb over uh, and he's allowed his hair to recede, whereas all the others, as you can see, have perfect heads of thick, glossy black hair, of which I am very jealous, of course. <laughs> I don't think I would ever qualify for that. There is supposed to be a leadership hair dye and wig factory and hair growing factory somewhere by the second ring road in Beijing. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but we'll come back to the anti-corruption campaign because it is very important and it's much more than just going for your political enemies, which such campaigns uh, usually do. So these are the seven people who run China at the moment. They will serve for five years. The Politburo serves, and the Standing Committee, for five-year periods between party congresses. The next party congress will be at the end of 2017. And Except because of age group, it's, it's understood, it's not written down anywhere, that you have to retire once you're 68, once you pass the age of 68, or once you've done two uh, standing committee terms. And of, under that stipulation, only she and Lee will stay on. The other five will have to go. So we're in a period, already getting into a period of intense politicking, where the, sto the next story in China, she stays on in charge, Lee probably stays on unless there's an economic bust and he has to be moved on one side, which has happened in the past. Uh, the question is who the new young people will be who will come up into the standing committee of the Politburo at the end of 2017 and they will run China once Xi Jinping steps down in 2022. Although given the power, which I'll come to in a second, that Xi has accumulated, of course there's already speculation that he may declare himself General Secretary for life but I think that's very unlikely. He would prefer to put in people who will do the business uh, and he can be the elder statesman behind the scenes who will pull the strings, which is what Deng Xiaoping did in the 1980s when he only had one job, which was in charge of the army, and, but he ran everything there. She, as I say, has accumulated enormous power. He is a princeling, that's to say a member of, uh, among the offspring of the first generation uh, Communist Party leaders. His father was a guerrilla fighter, uh, was a general in the Civil War, uh, thereafter was vice premier under Mao Zedong, was purged during the Cultural Revolution, and his son was sent to look after pigs uh, in a cave. Uh, she came back, he worked his way up the system uh, in provincial jobs, above all, not in Beijing. Uh, and in particular, he uh, was party secretary or governor in Shijiang and Fujian provinces, which were the most go-ahead economic uh, at the time. And also he nurtured very good links with the PLA, the very politically important army in China uh, during those years. Uh, so in 2012 November, he was declared Communist Party General Secretary. He uh, then became state president the following March, the two are... Uh, the, the party government uh, worked to different uh, rhythms. He became chair of the military commission, which puts him in charge of the PLA, which is extremely important uh, in China. It's more important than being state president, really. And then uh, he, during the course of 2013, 2014, he obviously thought, well, this system needs a bit of shaking up here. It needs centralization of power 
because despite the one-party system, China is very devolved, uh, the, the, the authority in China. So he set up four commissions, one for economic reform, one a National Security Council, which deals with both internal and external security, one on cyber security, and one on uh, modernizing, reforming uh, the PLA. And I'll give you two guesses as to who's chair of all these four new bodies. Uh, so he's accumulated that power. And also, it's a very good bet, although nothing is announced in this opaque sy system, that he is chair of the leading groups, as they're called, in the Politburo on foreign affairs, on economic affairs, on national policy, on Taiwan, uh, which have more power than government ministries. So he is, I would say, uh, the most powerful leader uh, in the world today. And also, he has to worry about the Communist Party. He has to worry about the vested interests. He has plenty of things to look out for behind him. But he doesn't have to worry about elections or about Congress or about a hung parliament or anything else. Uh, he's accumulated this power. And he also appears, uh, I know this is, you know, this is, depends, this is anecdotal, but he appears to be pretty popular. People like the idea of a strong leader, which he is. And he plays the PR extremely well. You may have seen pictures of him. He went to inspect a hospital and said, oh, I'll go for lunch in the local corner restaurant and ordered a soup and four buns. And that became, everybody had to have a soup and four buns, of course, everywhere. He paid 21 yuan for it. I saw it was on sale this in one of the luxury hotels in Beijing for rather more money. So you could have your luxury like that. He was photographed. Uh, inspecting the uh, new river port at Wuhan in central uh, China. And there was a downpour while he was doing this. He was wearing short a short shirt, a white shirt and uh, black trousers. And a photograph was taken of him holding his own umbrella, which was very unusual. Hu Jintao always had somebody holding the umbrella over him. He was holding his umbrella and he'd rolled up his trouser legs like somebody, you know, uh, caught at a British seaside resort by a, a downpour and so on. This incredibly, you know, folksy thing. And that went, that was on all Chinese websites. It went everywhere. And it wasn't censored. And this is the thing. Since the umbrella protests in Hong Kong, of course, this photograph has disappeared uh, from all official uh, websites. I've got one if you want it. Um, but uh, he, so he's played the PR well, and he's played the international scene extremely confidently, I think. Uh, he's met Obama a couple of times and really given away uh, nothing uh, on that. And US and uh, China have this edgy relationship, scratchy relationship. They have to get on with each other. They have to deal with each other. But neither of them actually wants to give any ground, find it easy. He's been launched very strong uh, attitude towards Japan, uh, which Abe has responded to. It must be said this is a, a two-way uh, affair there. Uh, with Southeast Asia, he's played hard and now he's playing soft uh, at the moment. The Vietnamese leader is in Beijing uh, this week. Uh, he's launched the idea of the new Silk Roads, both maritime round to the Gulf, with China building ports in Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Burma. And uh, he's launched the, the land uh, uh, Silk Road into Central Asia uh, with, uh, was it last week or the week before, about $42 billion worth of aid for Pakistan to begin with, followed by some of the smaller Central Asian Stan uh, states, Chinese, uh, one or two Chinese projects, energy, transport, account for the equivalent of 40% of GDP. So this has been a, a very big move, I think, which has not really been appreciated uh, uh, globally. And China thinks that it's got Russia where it wants it. It thinks uh, Putin is, is, has been greatly weakened by sanctions and uh, the, the conflict uh, in Ukraine, and that China can profit from this with the 400 billion gas deal to begin with, another gas deal to follow, lots of infrastructure projects, uh, military cooperation, anti-terrorist cooperation, and so on. China feels quite confident uh, uh, in this. So <clears throat> you've got Xi then launching uh, the BRICS bank, the BRICS uh, unit bank, which China will be much the biggest uh, contributor to. The Asian Infrastructure Bank, uh, which has been joined now, I think, by 50 uh, different uh, countries and is very much a Chinese uh, uh, creation. And other big funds where China is starting to spend its foreign exchange reserves which used to be used just to buy safe American treasury bonds. They're now recycling this money through the policy banks in China into an expansion, uh, a, a, if you like, an economic uh, uh, projection 
uh, of China's power on its borders, but then uh, more uh, widely. I mean, where is the finance for the new British nuclear power program, uh, Hinkley Point, etc., coming from? It's being built by the French, but it's being financed by the Chinese uh, through them. So there's a, a big, big expansion under Xi. And this, I think, takes China into a new uh, dimension. He has this China dream he's talked about, which has various elements, which is strengthening the Communist Party, ensuring national unity, making the party state more efficient, improved living standards for people, and this uh, enhanced regional and global weight backed by military uh, modernization. And a part of this is the anti-corruption campaign, launched as soon as he became General Secretary at the end of 2012. Uh, its two most prominent victims are here. Why are these two men smiling, you may ask themselves. Uh, on the right, they look as though they're on a late night television show, you know, telling jokes on David Letterman or something. But um, on the right, Bo Xi Lai, who was the maverick politician, uh, another princeling, uh, who ran Chongqing, this huge city-state in uh, city region uh, in western China, but was running his own thing, doing his own uh, shows, basically, running his own political campaigns, and the party centre can't put up with that. So he, he was brought down <coughs> just as she was uh, t uh, taking over. And then uh, Zhu Yongkan, uh, the stocky fellow, the other fellow there, who was the internal domestic security chief under Hu Jintao, an enormously powerful uh, post where supposedly he tapped, he t uh, tapped the telephones of, of the other party leaders, um, ran the police, ran the legal system, squashed Wen Jiabao when he talked about uh, reform. But he also had very, he was the godfather of the oil and gas industry uh, in China and very, very powerful in Sichuan uh, province there. And he, of course, as you'll have read, has now been brought uh, down. He's been expelled from the Communist Party, charged, and will go on trial in Tianjin uh, quite shortly, uh, and it'll be interesting. The, uh, we're not sure. He's, he's accused of bribery uh, is the main thing, but there are also tantalising accusations of infringing state security uh, and other things, and it may be, it depends how far, how much they want to publicise these matters. It could be one of the more interesting trials of the year. Uh, the anti-corruption campaign, I think, is being used not just to go for uh, political foes like that, but it has, is actually an instrument for Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang and Wang Qishan, who runs, who's running this campaign, of getting into the state sector in China and trying to make it more efficient. If you take the big state-owned enterprises in China, they suck up an awful lot of capital. They don't create many new jobs or any new jobs now. They contribute less and less to growth. They are a big, big impediment on China's growth and the evolution of China to the new economy, which it needs, because the old Deng Xiaoping era formula of a lot of cheap labor, a lot of cheap savings and capital, and benign external markets welcoming you, no longer works. Labor is more expensive in China, capital is more difficult and uh, more expensive to get, and as we know, the rest of the world is not exactly in the kind of welcoming of exports, uh, Chinese exports, to the extent that it was uh, in the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, so there is a recognition, I think, among the leadership in China, and I was there during the annual meeting of the legislature, the National People's Congress, uh, in March. I'm afraid it's left me with a frog, a kind of perpetual uh, frog in my throat. I may uh, collapse uh, coughing at some moment there. The, you never get away from the Beijing pollution entirely. Um, but um, there is a recognition of the need to change, the need for modernization. And I think the anti-corruption campaign is being used at least to open the door to that with uh, the targeting of some of the chiefs of some of the biggest state-owned enterprises, uh, conglomerates, the power generation uh, industry, uh, steel, uh, but particularly oil and gas. And the aim is to put in more efficient management, to cut out the waste, cut out the, the graft, and make these SOEs more efficient. That is a long-term project which runs up against lots and lots of vested interests. I don't say it'll necessarily be done, but there is the pro there's the po potential for this uh, uh, at the moment. And interestingly, at the beginning of this week, the heads of all three of the big oil and gas companies were replaced in China. Uh, 
we will see what they do, but there is certainly uh, a movement there that goes beyond just settling uh, political scores. On the other hand, the anti-corruption campaign uh, has got a lot of people scared, and the fear factor can prove, I think, to be very um, a great obstacle to the kind of risk and initiative that you need if you're going to bring in economic change. Uh, people are afraid uh, that they may, uh, something may be used against them at some point for a reason they don't know. Because all this is done outside the legal system. It's completely opaque. You're pulled in by the, the, the Discipline Commission. You disappear. You may reappear. You've been expelled from the party. And then you're handed over to the court system to be sentenced, basically. And that induces a, a, a degree, I think, of uncertainty and fear. On the popular level, there is recognition that things are changing. A friend of mine in Beijing, when I was there in March, said both his uh, baker and his butcher had remarked uh, recently how nice it was that the police for the first time, were paying full price for his goods instead of expecting to get it at half price. So that's good. On the other hand, uh, a friend of mine was in uh, Chengdu in Sichuan province uh, over Chinese New Year, and they had the family banquet uh, in a, uh, a restaurant, and the family patriarch was going to pay for this. He's a civil servant, and he gave my friend the money, the cash. He said, I cannot risk being photographed on the closed-circuit camera her handing over a large amount of money. So this may be used against me sometime. I mean, that's just at a popular level. You can see uh, the kind of complexities uh, which are involved in this. Well, uh, to conclude uh, and to come to the point uh, of my title there, finally, uh, China, there are great strengths in the current Chinese system. Just the pure, pure fact of China's rise from uh, what it was before this whole 35-year economic growth uh, uh, process started. And the ability, although big headlines, China's growth tapering off, China in for hard landing, etc., etc., but it's still, okay, the official print you can argue about, but it's still officially 7% growth, the last quarterly growth, and even if you take it down and use all kinds of other metrics, it's still in the 5.5 to 6% uh, range. So this is still pretty good uh, growth and there's no there are no problems so far with the labour market. There's pretty full. Don't believe the, the official four percent unemployment certainly, but the the, the labour market is still pretty strong uh, in China and exports have had some pretty good months. It, it must be said here. Consumption is still very slow in rising. Uh, that is a problem undoubtedly. But we're talking here, as I say, long term. There is stability, as I mentioned. There's national unity and there is the fact that the Communist Party since 1949, has made sure that there is no opposition. Uh, it has sucked up all the institutions of civil society uh, and in business. Every Chinese company of any size has a Communist Party cell, which can veto major business decisions. Every sports club has a Communist Party cell. Uh, it is uh, the phrase, uh, I hope this won't uh, offend anybody uh, here, but the phrase used is, the Communist Party is like God. It's everywhere, you just can't always see it. Uh, and it is seen to be um, everywhere, all pervasive, and there is no organized opposition, although there are fault lines, uh, which I will uh, uh, come to in a minute. And for many people, belonging, uh, young Chinese uh, uh, person, I, know, uh, I said, you know, she's lived in Australia, in Britain, she's uh, in various very capitalistic uh, enterprises. And I said, why do you keep up your membership of the Communist Party? She says, well, someday it'll be useful on the CV. So you can see there's a very material reason uh, for that. Um, the, so these are the strengths, but there are weaknesses. And there are very very significant weaknesses. As I say, I don't think they're going to bring the collapse of China, but these are what Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang think about. This is, I think, what keeps them awake. Well, when they keep awake at night, I don't know. But they're thinking of this when they're uh, shaving or brushing their teeth. Uh, the slowdown in the economy, while it is still decent growth, you are, they are operating in a society, and it's societal as much as economic, where people have been used to runaway growth. They've been used to bigger and bit higher and higher wages. They've been used to having more and more money. They're used to development. And now they are being told, we've got to moderate this. We've got to produce a more sustainable long-term economy. 
which people will agree with, but not when it hits them uh, in the pocketbook necessarily. And the slowing down of the economy is a major, it's probably the biggest economic uh, task uh, in the world today. And one effect of it, you can see China has 30% excess capacity in steel. Now it's not going to uh, suddenly expand to use that up. It's got lots and lots of excess capacity which is producing deflation, which makes the reform and the change which is necessary all the more difficult to bring in. Huge imbalances and inequalities. Imbalances between the rich uh, coastal provinces and Beijing and the poor western parts of China. You go to Shanghai on a Saturday night, it makes uh, London look dowdy. Um, go into Sichuan, drive around by Chengdu, and you'll find a lot of manufacturing plants there which are very, very basic metal bashing. I went to one which was making motorcycle uh, components, and it was literally rows of, 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 de of tables, mainly with mainly women workers, and they had a, a bit of metal, and they pushed it under a punch, and a, a little disc of metal came out, and they put it in a basket. This is very primitive manual uh, non-automated uh, manufacturing. And the inequalities, uh, the poor have got less poor in China over the last 35 years without any doubt, but the rich have got richer even faster. And the Gini coefficient, which measures uh, income inequalities, is much higher in China than it is in Europe or the United States there. Uh, and this creates uh, a good deal of resentment uh, in all the... There are a lot of polls. They're not always published in China, but that this comes out all the time. There's the concern about the quality of life, which I think may be the most important challenge they face, uh, the leadership. This is pollution, air pollution, which we, I'm sure we all know about, and the, 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 the smog in Beijing. But it's also water pollution, lack of clean water through, throughout China. It's soil pollution. Between 10 and 12% of uh, arable land in China is reckoned to be so polluted by pesticides, uh, heavy metal deposits and other things that it's unsafe to, unhealthy, to eat the crops uh, grown there. Linking on from that, there's food quality, worries about endless food scandals, putrid meat in sausages, uh, exploding watermelons, uh, everything else. That was a wonderful thing. Man. The man uh, injected his watermelons with chemicals to make them look even sweeter and even beaut more beautiful, and they all exploded in a, in a, su a supermarket a bit later. Um, yeah, that's not that serious, but it, it, <laughs> food safety is very important, and the, all the milk, the recurrent milk scandals, uh, the, a deal with, it just shows you the extent of, of concern. A deal was done last year, uh, last autumn, between an e-commerce company in China and dairies in New South Wales in Australia. And you order the milk online in Beijing. The order goes straight to New South Wales. The milk's put on a cargo plane and it's delivered to you in Beijing the next day and you pay nine times as much as the Australians do for their milk. So you can see somebody's making money, but also people are willing uh, to pay for that. There's the environment, I said, uh, the air pollution and all the other things which is there, and the, urban, the runaway urbanization of China, which has been quite, hasn't been handled uh, extremely well. There are the demographics, the falling uh, birth rate, not just the one-child policy, but fertility started falling around 1970 in China, contraception, and the sheer cost of having a child because uh, state health care is not good. You go to a private hospital and it costs you a lot of money. And then to find a place in a kindergarten is a real problem uh, and is very expensive too. So as the phrase goes, the, the prospect is that China will get old before it gets rich because people are living for longer and longer, with fewer people coming into the workforce, but more and more people who are going to need uh, old age uh, care. Agriculture is quite backward in most of China, small plots, lack of uh, scale farming, poor seeds, very bad fer nitrate fertilizers, lack of machinery, uh, lack of logistics and warehousing and refrigeration. Uh, I would say that China has not, it is, it's very good at adapting the innovations of other people to the Chinese market. The application patent is what most Chinese patient, patents are. It hasn't actually come up with many inventions all of its own. It's, it's moved on from the inventions of other. If you take uh, Alibaba, if you take Tencent, if you take the new uh, cheap uh, mobile phones and so on, they are all adapting technology that has been invented elsewhere to the Chinese uh, system. And for instance, there has been a Chinese, uh, to my knowledge, for at least six or seven, six, seven years, a project to launch uh, a civilian airliner. Uh, 
this is still going to take two or three more years to go. China can't build the engines. It can't build the, it, it hasn't got the technology for new uh, metals. So it'll be a heavy metal uh, equivalent of an Airbus or a Boeing of 30 or 30 years ago. Uh, technology in the PLA has moved ahead in submarines and satellites, but in a lot of other areas, China is still not coming up with either the innovation or the global brands. Uh, and then we have Tibet and Xinjiang, which I won't go on about, but they remain uh, major unsolved legacy problems there, where China, Beijing will not give up, but a lot of the people in Tibet and Xinjiang will not accept Chinese rule. And then, of course, you have Taiwan across the strait, which can't quite declare itself an independent country, uh, but acts as though it was one, uh, largely, and where the opposition DPP will almost certainly win next year's presidential election and we'll get this whole talk about uh, Taiwanese autonomy uh, coming up again. These are major problems, and externally, until recently, China was what's called a partial power. It played a world role, but largely on a bilateral basis with countries it was interested in. It's resource dependent, so it needs uh, all those resources uh, to come in. It doesn't have treaty allies with anybody except North Korea. The uh, PLA, is, despite the spending, is still way, way behind the Americans, who, remember, are based in southern Japan with the island chain going down to Taiwan and down to another American ally, the Philippines. You can understand if the Chinese feel this is a Cold War containment, 100 miles off your, your coast. But uh, China can't push back against that very effectively. And indeed, its push into the South China Sea uh, over a couple of years had exactly the reverse uh, result of countries like Vietnam wanting to get under the American uh, umbrella. And China, until very recently, has been unwilling to take what's called a global stakeholder role. Uh, that is changing under Xi Jinping with the various initiatives which I mentioned earlier. Uh, but we will see how that works out. And Chinese soft power, which they spent a lot of money on, um, it, it reaches so far. But uh, it, it, it's not surprising because it's a fairly recent uh, development. But uh, as Chinese ambassadors have said to me, we spend all this money why don't people why don't people feel more chinese why aren't they adopting more chinese uh, habits and so on and it's still the, the fact i would say that if you go to a chinese city not not just talking about beijing shanghai and so on but inland of the city uh, chengdu or somewhere like that you have far far more signs of westernization there than you would have signs of chinese influence in say edinburgh or uh, or birmingham uh, and from the political point of view, uh, I may sound provocative here, but uh, for good or bad, you still see people demonstrating in the Middle East, in Ukraine, elsewhere, in favour of Western democracy, which is supposed to be so hopeless. I have yet to see anybody marching in the streets for the installation of a Chinese political system. Uh, so I don't think the West is done for, uh, uh, as you will see. China will not dominate this century, as some have argued, First of all, because it recognises the need for change, but getting through that change, pushing it uh, through, is extremely difficult in a system where you have a single party which is so omnipotent uh, as China is. You have what I call the trust deficit. Uh, a joke, I mean, you might say it in many other countries, but it has a particular kind of meaning, I think, in China, is only believe something when the government denies it. Uh, and there's, there is this kind of feeling, and this is partly what the anti-corruption campaign is, uh, is about, this feeling of a gulf between the rule, ruled and uh, the rulers. And that shows through in the lack of an independent legal system uh, and accountability as society evolves very fast as a result. Uh, of, of the growth. You've got the environment and demographic problems, which I mentioned at the moment, uh, but you have at base a clash, I would say, between the rec recognition by Xi Jinping, by particularly Li Keqiang, of the need for reform, the need for change. But this inevitably threatens the status quo, the power of the party state, which is Xi Jinping's bottom line. So we have a contradiction and a problem going on here, which I think, since re regime preservation will take uh, first place in this uh, dichotomy here, means that China is actually not stuck in the middle income trap, but its potential 
for further evolution of the structures of the economy and of politics, which is needed to move into a new stage of development, uh, will not be there. So in the end, the nature of the system, which has preserved this last Leninist uh, nation on earth, will, I think, turn out to be a weakness. Now, when I say that, I've been accused by some people, including Chris Patton, of speaking like a Western liberal Democrat who can't possibly understand China. It's fine coming from him. Uh, and so, no, he said we. Oui. Uh, and I agree to that, that there may be a new Chinese way, which in the big reform document in November uh, 2013, stated we will use the mechanisms of the market, the dynamism of the market, to move China into a new phase. But read down a bit further, and it says all this change will take place in order to strengthen the state. And that is the kind of existential question which lies ahead of China, how those two can be reconciled. And I think that will be the main concern rather than trying to dominate the world, which I don't think in any case China particularly wants to do. Thank you very much.